but right okay our next speaker is an old friend of ours he's been from uh, apostle uh, he's always going around digging um, old bones um i i one, one of the things that he he highlighted uh, recently was that we have found some ancient bones in some cave and then some tv tv crew went in that inside there and then uh, very clumsily destroyed uh, I, maybe he'll he'll tell us the story later lah, but uh, the, uh, that that really got me hopping mad man like we've got no no uh, regard for any of these kinds of things i went to see the oldest uh, cave paintings in para and all the way i thought that it was only at the you know uh, uh, as we are walking towards the the, the paintings people had, had carved their names like not just one or two there were literally hundreds of them who had carved their names on the cave walls in in this our the our oldest paintings cave cave painting this is malaysia ah do i tell you anyway here is uh lim si shan uh, shen shen take it away all right thanks uh, pepper i need someone to share my slides from your end All right, great. So shall I start now? Yes, yes. All right, uh, very good afternoon to all of you. And uh, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, be part of this uh, first event from Apostles, the Advocates of the Propagations of Science Literacy. Is I think this is the first event uh, to be held in Malaysia. All right, uh, the topic of my talk today is Ice Age Mammals of Peninsula Malaysia as seen through the fossil record. Uh, next slide. All right, uh, over here, in this first slide, you could see a simple uh, diagram showing the history of Earth and also the life forms. Uh, the earliest and the oldest uh, deficits is at the bottom of the diagrams. And as one moves upwards, uh, you could see the, uh, the appearance of the different life forms and ultimately uh, the appearance of uh, our ancestors and also uh, these, our own species. And throughout this history of the life, uh, it is punctuated by at least five major breakdowns of life evolutions or the mass extinctions. The most uh, famous of which is the last one uh, which occurred around 65 million years ago that what up most of the uh, complicated life forms, including the non-birds uh, dinosaurs. And uh, what I'm going to talk about, uh, the mammal fossils, they are from the ice age, uh, generally uh, thought to be uh, starting around two and a half million years ago until the present. So we are at the present moment, uh, at the end of the Ice Age. Perhaps uh, next in the line would be, we will encounter the, the next Ice Age. All right, next slide. Let's have a closer look at the geological periods of the Ice Age. Uh, the Ice Age is usually divided into two major geological units for the Pleistocene, uh, the older one, the earlier one and also the Holocene, which is our current geological time. We are at the moment in Holocene. And for ease of convenience, the Pleistocene is further divided into three parts. And then you have the uh, late Pleistocene or the early Pleistocene. Oh, sorry, uh, you have the early Pleistocene, which start around two and a half million years and uh, until 781,000 years ago. And then the middle part of Pleistocene, uh, 781,000 to 120,000 years ago, last is the late Pleistocene period, which uh, starts from 126,000 years to uh, around 10,000 years. Next. Now, okay, uh, during the Ice Age or the Pleistocene, globally, it is a geological period characterized by a cyclical coal glaciers uh, and warm interglacial phases. And it is uh, not a one-way event, but uh, they move alternately to one another. 
so that after the cold and dry glacial periods, the warm and interglacial periods, the humid periods will come along next, and then it will be replaced by another cold period. So it is uh, moving in tandem, like cold, warm, cold, warm, and cold, warm. And this has a huge impact on the global temperatures and uh, humidities and so sea level, because during the cold and dry periods, uh, most of the liquid form of H2O in the air and also in the oceans are suck up and uh, to build up the massive ice sheets at both ends of the globe and also at higher latitudes uh, areas like in northern uh, Americas, northern Eurasias, and, and ice sheets also form at higher altitudes uh, places like uh, Mount Kilimanjaro and also even our I speak in Malaysia, it's not Kinabalu, has a, a moderate ice sheets uh, during the, the coldest periods. Next. All right, okay. Now, uh, we are familiar with this sort of uh, landform where Peninsula Malaysia is separated from Sumatra and Borneo and Java by uh, uh, oceans. But uh, the fact is that uh, we are surrounded by oceans of a shallow type. Uh, surrounding the western part of Southeast Asia is a very shallow continental shelf for this Sunda continental shelf. And during the Ice Age, when global environments started to, to become drier and colder, there will be a corresponding drop in sea levels. Next. And because we are surrounded by a shallow continental shell, emerge drops of the sea levels, for example, a minus uh, uh, 30 meters from the current uh, sea levels, we'll see that Sumatra would be connected to the mainland Asia. Next. Such as in this form, and we could also see the, the close of the Strait of Malacca. Next. Now, a further drop in sea level to uh, minus 40 as compared to the current levels, we can see that uh, the big islands of Borneo started connected with the landmass formed by Sumatra and uh, Peninsula Malaysia. Next. And a further drop of 10 meters uh, owing to the dry and cold conditions during the Ice Age, we, we could see that all the major islands of Western. Uh, Southeast Asia, like Sumatra, Borneo, and Java, they are connected to mainland Asia and form uh, landmass. Next. This landmass of subcontinental uh, extents is called Sunda land. Next. And on the exposed Sunda lands, there are large river systems. Some are as large as the current ones that we have in Southeast Asia, like the Mekong. Next. And because the exposed Sundaland is of subcontinental in extent, the middle part of the exposed land, they are less influenced by marine and coasted humidities. And some scientists postulated that in the central belt of these uh, exposed land, it experienced a drier conditions than we experience nowadays. And these drier conditions would encourage the growth of uh, drought resistance vegetations like the savanna. Next. And also, the, the soil conditions on the exposed Sunar land are of sandy, coarse in textures. And on coarse, sandy uh, soils, uh, evergreen, moist tropical rainforest cannot really grow well. So this would encourage also the growth of low productivity vegetation type, like heath, Karangas forest. And Karangas is an Iban or Dayak word, which means places where paddy will not grow. So it can only support uh, vegetations that are lower in productivities, like Samana or more open vegetations. Next. And all these changes during the Pleistocene periods, during the ice ages periods of um, warm and cold periods, dry and humid uh, periods, alternate with one another, 
as a profound effect on the evolution and distributions of land animals in Southeast Asia. Next. And it is under such uh, environmental conditions that most of the Ice Age mammals in the Simulases evolved. And uh, I, in this slide, I will introduce you to uh, some of the fossil sites that we have investigated in the Simulases. And uh, there are three sites, Cistern Caves, Swarm Caves, and Villa Caves, and Butter Caves. And all these three have been dated collectively to be around 66,000 to 33,000 years ago, which put them securely in the late Pleistocene periods of the Ice Age. And from these fossil sites, we managed to identify at least 22 kinds of uh, mammals, including three that are no longer exist in Peninsula Malaysia. Next. Here you can see uh, some pictures of the fossil sites. Cistern Cave and Swarm Caves is, is not a large cave and is less disturbed as compared to the Villa Cave, which has been partially developed into religious uh, a temple. Next. And here are the uh, raw conditions inside a cave in which we could find uh, cave secondary deficits and also the fossils that are embedded inside these uh, cave deficits. Next. This picture will show you how the fossils looks like in its uh, original state inside the cave, all surrounded by secondary cave deposits. And within the center of the pictures is a fossil tooth of an angulate. Next. This is also another example, but it is more uh, perfectly preserved than the previous one. With you could see this is a tooth of a fossil angulate as well. And you can see that the crown and the roots are perfectly preserved. Next. And if we uh, spotted fossils inside of the caves, and we think that it is important to extract it out of the cave deposits so that we could bring it back into the lab and the museums for further study, we'll use some specialized tools like chisels and geological hammers. And these extractions is a highly demanding work because uh, it needs to be carried out by professionals. If not, uh, Casual excavations will cause the breakage of the fossils. And once the fossils are breaking into pieces, it is no longer uh, useful for some scientific researchers. Next. Uh, the next sections I will show you is some of the examples of fossil fauna that we managed to recover from these three fossil sites in Butter Caves. Next. We have fossil teeth uh, of two kinds of wild boars, the common Eurasian wild boar that we always see uh, in suburban areas, and also another kind of uh, distinct species of uh, wild boar called bearded pigs, nowadays very limited in their distributions in the Peninsula Malaysia, limited only to the border areas between Perak and Selangor along the Slim rivers, and also the southeast corners of Pahang and the adjacent Andarumbing in Johor. Next. And we have uh, fossil teeth of the angulates, for example, the southern sural, which looks like a goat, but this is not a goat, this is more akin to the antelope than the goats. We have uh, fossil teeth of the wild cattle, most likely uh, the saladans or the gaul, the biggest wild cattle in the world. Next. Some other examples of deers, we have the medium sized barking deers. And also the largest species of deers in Malaysia is the Samba deers. Next. And very fortunately and surprisingly, we have also fossil representatives of the birth species of rhinos no longer exist in Peninsula Malaysia or anywhere else in Malaysia nowadays. The Sumatran rhino and the Javan rhino. Next. Here is an example of the fossil tooth of a Sumatran rhino. Next. And this is a lower molar of a rhinos. And we are in the process of trying to narrow down and see whether we could identify the species or not. 
but it is definitely a winer's next. And even though we have found some representatives of wines, it is very rare for us to find tapirs for reasons still unknown. Uh, uh, tapirs seems to be it rarely represented in the fossil record than the rhinos. Next. We have also examples of two species of bears, the Malayan sun bear, which is still a living species in the rainforest of uh, Malaysia, and also the locally extinct Asian black bear. Now within Southeast Asia, the closest living population to Asian black bears is in Southern Thailands. For the South and that, there's no living representative. So it's an extremely lucky that we, we managed to find the fossil records, the first one in the country, in Butter Caves and some other places, like uh, a couple of uh, caves in Bahang. Next. For the tiny walls, we have also representatives from Tiger and the Malay Civet, on commonly known as Musang. Next. Now we have uh, uh, some uh, fossils uh, from the primates, uh, the most commonly uh, encounters primates are the long tailed macaques. And also uh, in the pictures, you can see two uh, teeth of the langles, which is uh, called the leaf eating uh, monkeys. Next. And very surprisingly, and when I first uh, went inside the caves and uh, used some fossil research, we stumbled upon the first record of orangutans in Peninsular Malaysia. Next. So I'm going to show you some of the first discoveries from Peninsular Malaysia, which have, uh, we have reported back in 2013. This is uh, one of the teeth that we found in um, one of the caves in, in Butter Caves. It is, uh, I think, a tooth of orangutans. Next. Here's another example of a tooth of orangutans. And as you could see, one of the most diagnostic features of the orangutan teeth is the crown surface. You can see the ripples surface. And this is the most diagnostic features of orangutans. Once you see it on the crown of tooth, definitely you could identify it. It is orangutan's tooth. Next. Here's more examples of orangutan's tooth, uh, including the incisor to front tooth. Next. And this one is a very beautiful specimen of the molars, lower molars of orangutans found from Villa Caves, from the uh, uh, some of the deposits that uh, survived in this inside the cave where you there is a, a Hindu temple. Next. Apart from the medium sized and large sized mammals, we have also. Uh, fossil remains of the smaller animals like uh, the brush tube porcupine and the forest living rat, spiny rat. Next. There are uh, fossil teeth of very small size, uh, of a size less uh, smaller than the grain of uh, the, uh, the rice. So that in order for us to look clearly at the, the crown morphologies for species identifications, we need to, to put it under the scanning electron microscript. Next. And we have also a representatives of the fossils from smaller mammals like the shrews and tree shrews that uh, the, they have the living uh, living animals uh, around some urban areas. Next. And quite naturally, inside the caves, you will find a lot of the animal remains from the bats, like the large size for eating bats, and also uh, many species of the smaller size insect eating bats. Next. And again, the, the, the tooth of bats are so small that we have to put it under the scanning electron microscope in order to see clearly the diagnostic features. Next. So uh, these fornales is a combination of all the fossil fornales we found from three sites in Butter Caves, it gives you uh, uh, a sense of the, the diversity of mammals from prehistoric times around Kuala Lumpur. Many of these species, of course, you cannot now 
find around in Kuala Lumpur, even in the sub areas of Kuala Lumpur. And uh, some has already extinct from uh, Peninsular Malaysia. For example, the orangutans, the Sumatran rhinos, German rhinos, the Asian black bears. But uh, these fossil fauna do really show that during the prehistoric time, we have a much, much diverse mammal fauna as compared to nowadays. Next. So uh, how does Southeast Asia or Peninsular Malaysia look like uh, when these animals were, were living around about the caves and their fossils were embedded inside the caves? Next. So as I mentioned earlier, all three sites have been dated and they collectively ranged in a geologic age from 33,000 to 66,000 years ago. And during these uh, periods, the uh, western part of Southeast Asia experienced uh, dramatic changes from the uh, warm interglacial periods to the dried and cold glacial periods. And then we could see there are two extreme forms of uh, local geography over here, whereby during the warm periods, like uh, today's, the, the sea levels is uh, comparable to the levels of today's, and that is the weather is much warmer and, and it is more humid, and that all the, the uh, islands are separated from one another by a shallow seas. But during the cold and dried glacial periods, because of the uh, lower sea levels, all islands would be connected and form the Sunda land. And even though during the glacial periods, it is cold and dry, because uh, Southeast Asia is located at equatorial regions, the environmental um, temperatures is um, no uh, greater than minus, uh, no greater than 10 degrees lower than the current levels. So we are still experiencing uh, some climate uh, similar to, to the in the Cameron Highlands or the Gunting Highlands during the, the cold period. Definitely not no uh, last scaled ice sheets or snowing in Southeast Asia during the, the glacier periods. Next. So uh, I think that uh, orangutans is one of my favorites. And uh, as a forest dependence species is a good indicator of past environmental changes. And over here, you could see the, the history of uh, research on orangutans. And the fossils of orangutans have been found in a large geographic areas from uh, as far north as southern China and as far south as the, the island of Java. So it is uh, basically in the prehistoric time much wider in distributions and a pan Sunda land uh, great apes. And, and what we are seeing now today is are the living populations in Sumatra and Borneo are really just uh, uh, the remnant populations of the once widespread and successful great apes. So in this, I think that it gives us a very strong justification to protect uh, some of the, the uh, very lucky living populations of orangutans. Next. So uh, here are some of the uh, conclusions uh, from the research on the Ice Age mammals of Peninsular Malaysia. Some animals of the modern day mammal fauna of Peninsular Malaysia, especially the medium to the last type members, for example, elephants and also the orangutans, they have a long evolution history as indicated by the fossil discoveries. Uh, if we just look at the, the Buttercage records, some of the uh, mammals and species, they have a, 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 have a geological history extended back to, to 66,000 years ago. And many of the species, except humans, they experience geographic range reductions. Another good example is the orangutans, whereas in the past, they have the wide uh, pan Sunda land distributions. Nowadays, they are limited to pockets of rainforest in Sumatra and Borneo. And some of the species are no longer exist in Peninsula Malaysia. And for reasons that are still under investigations, for example, the Asian black bear and also the uh, orangutans. But I suspected that it's because of the the uh, recurrent changes in the environment and the vegetations, and also uh, so, some of uh, the areas they experience prehistoric hunting as well. All these factors in combinations, they have caused the collapse of the populations of orangutans and ultimately 
caused the total extinctions of orangutans from mainland Asia. All right, I think with that, I would end my uh, presentation today. So I'm happy to answer your questions. There's any. Just now, you, just now you said that uh, even though these are ice age, I think you, what you meant is ice age period because we that we never had an ice age in our area, right? Yes, true, exactly. I, ice age, you could understand it as the glacial period when it is very cold, or you could understand it as a general geological terms which encompass the Pleistocene and the Holocene as well. So. In, in that sense, the Ice Age would be composed of a cyclical events of glaciers into glaciers, glaciers into glaciers, glacier into glaciers. And we are at the moment in the last uh, interglaciers, warm periods. So perhaps in the next 10,000 years later, we will enter the next uh, Ice Age, the glacier periods. I said. Yeah. Uh... You, you you showing us the the sea level uh, at that time uh. mm -hmm. it's very low right yes um uh most um the average ocean depth of the south china sea is now uh less than 50 meters holy shit yeah but most of the areas is even a shallower less than 20 meters so hey, you, a, mer, a mer drop uh, of sea levels will see a, a land connections between some of the major islands in Western Southeast Asia. Hey, hey, hey. Do, do you think uh, Philippines is connected to Sabah? Is sometime... oh, all right, all right. That, that is considered the middle part of Southeast Asia, the eastern part of Southeast Asia. Those areas have a, a much deeper ocean floor than the shallow continental shelf that we call Sundaland. Wow. So, uh, because I was thinking like the Homo luzonensis, all right? So, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So they found the, the fossil of the Homo luzonensis and mm -hmm. where did they come from? Well, it, it's still uh, under speculations how Homo uh, luzonensis and also the Homo forensis ended up in, in isolated islands that never really connected to any of the mainlands during yeah, yeah. the lowest uh, sea level periods or the, the coldest uh, periods during the, the Pleistocene. So it's, it's, it's still a puzzle. But, but do you think it's uh, somehow uh, they came from a Borneo or something? <laughs> um, most, most likely they, they came from the north. And for the Luzonenses, I think that they might be coming from the north uh, through some uh, watercraft uh, interventions. Seriously? <laughs> yeah, I think I think so. I think Sabah, so. Right? It's, it's one on one of the plausible explanations. Because because if you think about it, Sabah is, is more uh, closer to 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 Philippines. <laughs> I was I, yeah, just, uh, just my Sa Sa Sabah is closer to the Philippines in terms of the southern islands like Palawan, uh, Midanao, but Luzon is uh, a little bit further. Okay, and okay, you're Luzon, right, you're right. Luzon perhaps is, is um, it would be easiest to, for, for animals to, to drift down through the ocean columns from, yeah. uh, from Taiwan, southern China, and then to uh, the main islands in the north, Luzon. Mm. Because, because you, you, you show us the, the distribution of orangutan, huh? orang. Uh, mm -hmm. Orangutan also can distribute so largely in Southeast Asia. I think I think some other guys can can travel too <laughs> at that time. Yeah, 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 yeah. Perhaps <laughs> they have that's some sort of uh, watercraft techniques that we do not know. Okay, okay, uh, that's my question. Okay, I have a question. Hello. Hello. Yep. Yep. Please go ahead. So there's, I think there's feedback. I got two speakers. Oh, sorry. Anyway, I, I gotta fix my audio. There's something, some feedback. Anyway. Um, I think there are some questions in the comments. Uh, perhaps we can look at those. All right. Uh, I'll try to look at. Uh, let's see. All right. Uh, I'll start on the last one. Uh, which techniques did you use to preparations for fossils? Of red tooth on the cave brachias. All right. Uh, in order, we we in order to to uh, 
extract some of the smaller fossils like uh, jaw bones of bats and rats. We usually we, we tried flotations. We use a series of solutions just to, to uh, dissolve the sediments and then and we would uh, check the residues of the sediments under microscopes. And I think that there's the most efficient way and not, not expensive as well. Okay, and what are the approximate date ranges of the fossils found in peninsula malaysia Were they carbon dated or using other methods and how reliable are the dates? Okay, uh, we are using a couple of methods. Uh, for example, um, uranium series and also the red light thermoluminescence techniques and uh, some of the techniques there has um, some, some um, these techniques have been, that we use has been um, modified to take into account all the, the disturbances that might happen in the tropics. But we are, we will be trying more methods in futures to get a more refined date. All right, and the Ice Age precedent to date was this also the time when humans migrated down south to Indonesia and Australia. Uh, highly possible. There, there are uh, uh, more than one wave of migrations from Western Southeast Asia into Australia. And I think um, the latest wave would be uh, for the Homo sapiens, but then before the Homo sapiens, there are there are a couple of uh, previous uh, migrations into some other areas, especially into Eastern Indonesia, in the uh, Lesser Sunda Islands, into Sulawesi, and so so on further to the east. Uh, I have a question. All right, uh, please. Uh, so the Sunda Shelf is basically is the reason why we don't get tsunamis, is it? Tsunamis. Um, Oh, we we uh, we could still get the tsunamis at the edge of the Sunda shell. Well, I thought I thought I read somewhere that that's the yeah, reason no. why. Kang Chong, you need waves. to uh, you need to mute your 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 mic, Kang Chong. Okay, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, I thought the Sunda shell was one of the reason why we have reduced tsunami. Um, tsunamis are not likely uh, to reach us. Well, well, if the earthquake is strong enough, I think they could cause the tsunamis. In area less than twenty meters sea depth, okay. yeah, some of oh, the right. areas are more than twenty meters sea depth. Uh, like on average, they, they are around fifty meters, and sometimes it could go down to one hundred and sixteen meters in in the shallow the continental shelf. So if the the earthquake is strong enough, or the epicenter is uh, much more uh, shallow, then perhaps they could trigger the tidal waves tsunami. <clears throat> so, uh, in this field, how much do you actually have to know about the, uh, about the, <clears throat> because it's such a huge field, how much do you have to know as well about uh, uh, weather and, uh, say, climatology, oceanography, do you have to study all that just for... Oh, yes, definitely, yeah, because uh, uh, our aim is to get uh, a more complete picture of how uh, life evolves and response to these past climate changes mm. during the, the, the uh, past two and a half million years. So um, the more lines of research would, would, would provide us a better understanding, especially uh, giving us a clue of how past biodiversity responded to climate change. They may have informed us how we could cope with the current uh, problems, the environmental problems that have been faced to date. Oh, I see. So, so you, you, there's there's a lot of communication as well as in the fields like uh, uh, meteorology, which is weather, and climatology, which is large scale weather, and oceanography on the climate scale. There's a lot of oh, yes. intercommunication yes. between those disciplines and yours. Yes, yes, of course. Uh, and uh, paleontology is, is is part of the uh, research teams as we we do incorporate it. Uh, inputs from paleoclimatologists. In fact, one of my uh, senior colleagues in the University of Malaya, she is uh, specialized in looking into past climate reports from the stellar mines and stellar tides inside of the caves. Oh. So we do, uh, we do really need to combine all these information together. 
and not just the fossils or identifications of fossils. We need um, quite lots of inputs from the study of ancient pollens, the studies of hydrologies of the Sundarlands, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, this, is this is a rather young field, is it, compared to uh, um, weather in, and climate? In Malaysia, in yes. In Malaysia, yes. But we, but we have, um, well, uh, more experienced colleagues from the north in Thailand, the South China, oh. and also uh, we have colleagues in Indonesia where I started such kind of research way back into even before the Second World War. But, but Malaysia is a slow oh. starter. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Oh, yeah. Uh, how big is the black bear actually compared to Russian black bears? <laughs> uh, what, what bear? Russia, how big our, were our bears compared to modern Russian okay. black bears, the ones the in bear, Russia? And all that? Uh, the, the living Malayan sun bear is the smallest bear uh, living to date. Oh. And the Asiatic black bear is, um, is more or less the size of uh, the American black bear. So it's definitely smaller than the the modern see. modern black bear, the ones yes. in Russia yeah. continent, smaller. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, smaller. Uh, Somebody else like to ask a question? All right, <laughs> sorry. I talk too much. Yeah, no, if, if no one else, then Adi, you can you can ask again. again. Uh, I, I got lots of questions, but all the names are missing. Okay, okay. We, I was going to ask him about somebody else. Stuff, but I forgot. We will let somebody else ask a question. Anybody else? I'll try to read um, from the chart. Is is any? All right. Okay, there's uh, one question from my colleagues from Vietnam. Uh, uh, is that any changing of the fauna between the late Pleistocene and changed time of Pleistocene Holocene in Malaysia? Any species that extinct already? So in the late Pleistocene and Holocene, um, if we are talking about Peninsular Malaysia, we do have some um, examples of uh, extinctions, like I mentioned earlier, uh, the orangutans and also the Asiatic black bears. We have also uh, some local extinctions of the smaller carnivores like the hot badgers. And, and of course, uh, one of the most recently found fossils, the stegodons, uh, we have dated the stegodon fossils, uh, uh, age is roughly around 31,000 years, which put it into the late Pleistocene period. So this is one of the elements of the late Pleistocene period that went totally extinct from Malaysia and from, of course, from around the world. Anybody else? We've got another two minutes before we take our break and during the break, please don't go anywhere. Uh, Adi is going to play you some bastardized classical music and Quan Jet will tell you why he's so happy with science. <laughs> but a few more minutes. Pak, you got a question? Uh, not anymore. Not okay. anymore. Anybody else? If you don't have that, I've got one. How the hell did you get to into Batu Cave to make your... your findings <laughs> <laughs> all right uh i was introduced into caving by my cousins so we went caving just to look in uh we're interested in some of the invertebrate uh, species the insects ecologies inside the, the caves so we went there just for fun and uh, to start off some uh scientific research into the ecologies of these uh unique ecosystems and in the process we stumbled upon some of the fossils inside uh, that was about uh, one and a half decade ago, and ever since I found the first fossils in Bat Caves, uh, I continue on with the research, yeah, non-stop. So the one, the temple gave you permission? Well, Bat Caves is more than the temple cave. The temple cave is only the major cave, and around the whole hill, they are now on record about uh, um, two dozens uh, cave sites. And we have explored some of these uh, minor cave sites and then they do produce some very rich uh, uh, fossils if they are not disturbed, which means that there's no large scale modifications of the interiors of the caves 
like the Tampa Caves is, is already quite developed in the sense that they, they almost destroyed most of the original caves soils and together whatever archaeological artifacts or uh, mammal fossils there, there might be inside it. So we just target on some of the smaller caves. Okay, okay. I'm, I'm not, I'm not okay. going to ask you where the caves are because I, I don't want people visiting the caves and, and then sable and destroying all the, you know, mm -hmm. the nice fossils. That, that's part there. of our concern as well. That's part of our concerns. We hope yeah. that by raising public awareness, people know that uh, going inside the caves and then to do some treasure hunting is highly detrimental to scientific investigations. So just let the professionals do the works. And then, and of course, the professionals, um, we have the obligation to pass down all this information to the public because in the end, what funded our research is from you, all the taxpayers. So we have the obligation to pass down all the information free to all uh, uh, levels of the society. Uh, Le Pop has uh, a, a question. I think he's, put his, he's raised his hand. All right, please go ahead. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, sure. Hi, hi, Lei. Yeah, hi. I would like to ask you about the the location of the cave. It is very high from the from the from now surface, or it's very low. The black the later Pleistocene cave. Uh, uh, I mean. Yeah. In, in late Pleistocene, for example, the those fossil caves in in Butter Caves, they are all ground level caves, small and in in small chambers, narrow passages. So they are they are not like some of the older caves that we have in in Perak, in Kindal Valley, and also in Langong. These are mostly located at the mid level of the hill. They are sometimes older. And the entrance is small. Uh, mostly the entrance are small, quite small, yeah. Not as large as you would get in, in like Nia or in uh, the Tampa Caves, in Butter Caves. So how do you think that the, the fossil can get into the cave that because of the small memo that they bring is inside or because of the, the flooding? Uh, it, it depends on the caves because each cave would have their, their own story to tell. They have their own characters. And some of the caves, they, they have these animal remains inside because of um, they are the, the, the uh, natural habitats of uh, some smaller mammals like porcupines or leopards or tigers, which when after they, they preyed on the animals, they have left uh, whatever there's left over inside the caves. And these animal remains will uh, gradually incorporate it into the cave soils and become fossils. But some of the caves they do showed uh, signs of um, of a uh, of reverse movements uh, of sediments, fluvious sediments inside the caves. So perhaps uh, there's combinations of different processes that ended up uh, with fossils inside the caves. And because you showed me about the rockodai tomb before, and mm -hmm. is that the cave very near the 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 river? Um, uh, that cave with the crocodile fossils, it's, there's no uh, rivers or stream next to it. No, it's simply a dry area. A dry area? With yes, it's crocodile. a dry area. Yeah. How you can get in that? Yeah, <laughs> I, have no, I have no <laughs> ideas. But perhaps there might be rivers around it that uh, is uh, seasonal. We, we do not know. We really need to go and look at these uh, these new cave sites with uh, some of the major uh, memo findings from Kinta Valleys. And is that, I mean, that is very far from the river in, in, in recent day or, because I would, if, if it uh, is belong to the, the old riverbed, I think is crocodile is possible, but you say that it's very dry. It's, I don't know how it, yeah. The, yeah, I, I, yeah, I have no idea. <laughs> I have no <laughs> idea, but we definitely need some Strange. more in-depth uh, studies on, on these cave sites and to see it, um, what are the possible natural processes uh, that, that, that cause the accumulations of all these animal remains inside the caves. Yeah, it will be a fascinating study, but a, might be a very difficult one. Okay, uh, we're going to take a short break, but uh, please don't go away. 
thanks so much, uh, Shun. Yeah, it's always uh, lovely to hear you speaking. Uh, yeah, yeah, thanks. It's, well, it's, it's always fascinating when you speak because I, I, we, we never think of Malaysia having fossils. I always think of other countries having fossils, but not us, you know. <laughs> so it's always a yeah, good reminder that we, we, we have quite a lot of fossils. Anyway, uh, I've got a, uh, a, a talented musician who's going to be entertaining us while we take a 30-minute break. We will come back again at 4.45 sharp for uh, Afik to speak on pulsars. So, uh, but right now, uh, please uh, turn on your, your, your speakers and Adi is going to play you some bastardized classical music. And then after he's done, uh, Kwanjit will, will speak on uh, something about happiness. Okay, so Adi, are you ready? Okay. Yeah, the speakers are on. The speakers are not on. Uh, and for the rest of you, if you could turn on your uh, videos as a courtesy to the the ones uh, who are presenting, so that at least they can see that you know they're not speaking to nobody on the other side. If you can, if you can, yeah, that that'll be great. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to mute now and let Adi uh, do his thing, and I'm going to sneak off to the toilet. Mm -hmm. Turn on. Yeah. Yeah. Is there any way I can hear that? Um, they can hear you. Uh, they can hear you. I need some feedback. Oh, you can hear from her. Okay, so you, can you say? So, so unfortunately, I don't have a, I don't have a, a, an actual digital camera, so I'm using keyboard. I'll be doing uh, interpretations on uh, Chopin, Frederic Chopin. So this is a Chopin. <clears throat> First piece is Prelude to Chopin in G sharp iron.
uh, prelude in F sharp major. That's prelude in F sharp major. <clears throat>
Uh, this is the last piece. This is called uh, Prelude in B flat major. That's Prelude in B flat major. That's quite good. <laughs> Interesting. Okay. I don't know what the, what, what the, the original composers would think, but never mind. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Thank you. Bravo, bravo. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, uh, Quanjit, uh, are you ready? Uh, Quanjit, you, you have until 4.45 sharp, like sharp, sharp, because uh, uh, what... Um, Afik will be speaking at 4.45 sharp, okay? Okay, take it away, Quanjit. Okay, so um, thank you, everyone. So I'm going to be speaking 